Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are delighted to have you join us today. Thank you for tuning in to the Tech Life session by Odetta. Tonight, a really special guest has joined us, who has two degrees in mechanical engineering from the Stanford University. Anna Katrina is the CEO and one of the two founders of Instrumental. Instrumental is a manufacturing optimization software company. Before working at Instrumental, Anna, Anna was an uh, Apple product design engineer for six years. She designed the mechanical components for three iPods and led a system product design for the Apple Watch Series 1. She regularly speaks for the future of manufacturing and automation, and she writes advocately uh, and is an uh, active contributor for Forbes as well. As an advocate for increased diversity in technology, she founded a Women in STEM mentorship program in 2013. So let's have her tonight. Hi, Anna. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. It's so great to have you here today. Thanks for inviting me. So how's your day going along so far? Well, it just got started because it's nine in the morning and this is when I usually am starting work. So uh, I don't know yet how the day is going to go, but it's starting off pretty pretty well in good company, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> we're very really excited to have you here tonight. It's, it's like the end of the day here and still everybody is really, really happy to have you. Great. Okay. So we would love to get started to, you know, by getting to know you. So we want to know you how you were as a kid. So you made it to Stanford, so we're really interested in how you were doing as a student. Uh, sure. Uh, so I grew up in uh, a little bit north of New York City in New York State um, in a small town. It's pretty rural. Uh, cows, you know, things like that. Um, and spent a lot of time outside as a kid, uh, but was really into building stuff like art um, and writing as a kid. Um, and in high school, I did a, essentially a science research program. Uh, and that was really mm -hmm. what accelerated me uh, forward uh, into the career that I ended up in. Um, and I, incidentally, it was around 2002, 2003, when I was doing the, this project, and um, SARS was kind of a big deal at that time. And so I actually did an epidemiology project uh, as part of my science research project. Um, I spent about two or three years on that as an extracurricular activity, like going to night school, like working on this uh, independent research, the simulation I built um, for modeling epidemic spread through different types of populations with different amounts of what we now call social distancing. Uh, so it's highly uh, interesting how life comes full circle. Um, but I actually competed with that project at the International Science and Engineering Fair. Um, and that is ultimately, I think, where I got my start uh, in a variety of ways. I think one, um, being able to distinguish myself coming from a small town um, so that, you know, I think I attribute that to, to making my application interesting to Stanford when I applied. Um, but I also think that when you do something for, uh, when you do something like that as a kid, you learn lots of really valuable lessons. Uh, so a couple really valuable lessons were one, like take a big problem and break it down into pieces. So my, I had a, a, a teacher um, who taught me that one, who I think was very influential on me. Um, and then the other one is when you, when you kind of do something for many hours, uh, you can become an expert in it and you don't have to be afraid of people uh, questioning your work because you know it better than anybody else. Um, and I think that was a useful lesson to learn so young. And as a result, like I actually enjoy public speaking. I know that many people have you know, stage fright and they, they hate getting up and, and sharing their ideas, but I actually find it incredibly energizing. And I attribute it to um, very positive experiences I had as a teenager competing with science research. And now, of course, that's like a really valuable skill, um, not only in, in work life, but also as an entrepreneur, you end up doing a lot of a lot of pitching, a lot of, of public speaking, and a lot of defending your work. Uh, so yeah. kind of a little bit about me and kind of where I came from um, as a student. I, I actually started uh, my time at Stanford thinking I was gonna be an epidemiologist, which a lot of people didn't know before the, in the last like year what that was, but now they do. Um, but quickly realized that that was not gonna be where my passion was um, and, uh, and, and chose to be a mechanical engineer. So, I mean, 
usually students are thinking about how to how what dress to wear to a prom and you were thinking about making <laughs> really interesting stuff i how did you I still went to prom. You, still to prom. you can you can do both you do not have to choose you couldn't have it all <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i'm so glad that you were having it all uh, in your in your teenage years so like when so you knew you wanted to be an epic I don't even know how to pronounce that word. It's a tongue twister for me. I'm sorry. No problem. So, so like considering the situation these um, this year, are you reconsidering what you wanted to do back then? Uh, no. So I mean, I I was really interested in epidemiology because it was really math based. Um, and as a high schooler, I found math to be a really interesting subject. Uh, I think like in retrospect. I was mostly interested in it because it was one of the subjects that was actually really challenging for me and hard. Uh, and when I got to Stanford, I realized I wasn't actually that good at math. Um, I just liked it because it was hard. Um, <laughs> and then it got very hard. Uh, and so I realized that like, maybe I wasn't cut out to be a mathematician. Um, and it was a whole, it was a whole like uh, transition for me. you know, you go from being feeling like you can do anything and, and like a big fish in a small pond in high school and you show up at Stanford and like suddenly every other kid like already knows what you're learning and you're just like, you feel so far behind. Um, but I, I kind of stuck to the things that I know that I enjoyed, which was like building stuff. And even though, even though that kind of manifested as a child in building art or crafting things, um, ultimately has been a passion of mine. And so, it's kind of it's kind of what drew me in uh, to mechanical engineering. So when you were doing mechanical engineering, did you ever think that you'd get into Apple? I actually um, I would call myself a pretty naive student. So <laughs> I at the time in uh, university, you know, they, they have job fairs, right? And like sometimes they'll list like these are the types of majors we're hiring for. And there were only ever like four companies that would show up that would be hiring mechanical engineers. Like it was like oil and gas automotive, space. Um, and like, I was actually like not particularly interested in any of those um, as, a, as a career. Uh, and so I kind of fell into mechanical engineering because my passion was building stuff, uh, but I didn't really know what I was gonna do with the degree. I didn't have like a plan. Uh, I actually graduated from university at a pretty bad time or previous, previous worst time to graduate, which was around 2008, 2009, uh, entered the job market at that time. And um, I, I was interviewing for jobs and like, it was really hard because there were people who actually had experience like interviewing for jobs. And I, you know, was just a fresh grad. Um, but uh, I was very fortunate in that I had a professor who I kind of went and complained to. I was like whining about like, oh, I can't find something I want to do. Um, he was like, oh, well, I just like got a call from a recruiter at Apple. Like maybe you should talk to them. And I was like, Apple, don't they like make software? So like, you have to remember, like go back in time. Apple didn't have like all these glorified devices. They had like a, a few. Um, and so it hadn't even occurred to me that they needed mechanical engineers. Um, and so I actually went and interviewed there and I didn't even own an Apple device before I started at Apple. Um, so that was, that was an experience and was not part of the plan. That's life kind of, you know, making the path where you make your path for yourself. So you were happy where you ended? Oh yeah, absolutely. Apple is a great place to grow up as an engineer. Um, you are given as, as much responsibility as you can take. Uh, and you're given a lot of resources to really essentially do engineering the right way, which a lot of times, uh, if you're, if you have less resources, you often have to make concessions on your engineering. And so maybe you don't quite learn as much as fast, or maybe you learn different things. Um, I don't know. I haven't had that experience, but it was a great place to grow up as an engineer. Uh, learned a lot, learned about building millions of things, learned about building really high quality products. Um, and it was, uh, it's an experience with trade for anything. So considering Apple, Apple like is the statement, you know, it's the benchmark that you, everybody needs to meet, you know, the, in terms of efficient, efficiency, in terms of um, the, the, you know, the time efficiency and the space that it's consuming and everything. Uh, and it must have gone through a lot of standard of procedures and a lot of things that, you know, as a student, when you were studying in uh, Stanford, you did not think of things that way. How was that experience for you? Oh, yeah. Um there's a big gap between what you learn in university and what you do in your career. Um, and I think that's actually a good thing because it means that you don't 
you don't have to specialize when you're 18 years old and decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. You can like decide later because there is a significant portion of this particular job. And I imagine many other jobs where you learn a lot of the job on the job. Um, and so one of the kind of big transitions for me, um, well, like, frankly, I like I had been prepared on how to solve a challenging problem and how to not be afraid of the challenge. That was kind of what I got from my Stanford experience as like an engineer from Stanford. Um, and I'd also kind of been trained to, like, become an expert in some expert, like air quotes expert, not a real expert, become an expert in something by, like, reading about it and trying to be an expert about it and that you can actually like make a lot of progress that way. Um, and so while there was a lot to learn at Apple, um, I like was able to like use the experience to absorb some of the things I did use like statistics. It's actually very important as a mechanical engineer. I didn't realize that kind of going in, uh, but I did use that because again, I was interested in math and epidemiology. So I had like a statistics background. Um, and what else is important? Um, I think really just like how to solve a problem. Um, and everything else, everything else you can figure out. Like, yes, there's physics. Yes, there's free body diagrams. Yes, you're trying to design like physical things, um, you know, using virtual tools. But uh, there's a, a lot of it um, that you can pick up on the job. And so I was very fortunate that someone invested in me to enable me to do that. Um, and, you know, I originally went to Apple because I was interested in learning how to build perfect things, because that's certainly like what they project. Um, and it kind of opened up this whole world of uh, what is the state of manufacturing, electronics manufacturing. Um, and that's something I didn't really know. Like, I didn't think I would go into um, as like a career. Uh, and it's actually become something I am really passionate about as, a, as an industry, um, which is kind of like an odd thing. If you like think back to like being a high schooler, like who's interested in math, like somehow ending up like uh, being someone who speaks on and writes about manufacturing and the, and the future of manufacturing. So you found math really hard and now that all I've seen some of your videos and your, your speaker sessions that you've had before, and you were really passionate about it, even though you found it really hard. How did you come to love something that was hard to solve back then? Uh, you mean math in particular, or what do you, sorry, I don't quite understand. The math, ma math in particular, because it's a very, uh, like generically, it's considered as a very tough subject to love. Yeah, yeah, I was not good at it. I will just say that I am not good at it. <laughs> um, I, you know, like there's some, there's a certain elegance in it that like when you do, when you do start to figure it out, I remember like learning proofs in particular was very challenging for me. Um, I feel like I, I feel like I was kind of thrown into the deep end and like everybody else already knew how to do them. So nobody like, nobody like taught me how, um, and you kind of had to just like figure it out in the dark. Um, certainly I like found friends who were who already kind of knew what they were doing to help explain it to me. Um, but like when you, when th something starts to click and it makes sense, uh, then that's really empowering um, and exciting. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's, it's always been a challenge for me. I mean, I'm, I'm like, I'm okay at math. I'm not like terrible, but like, I, I still sit, like, I still, like, I'm, like, my desk is right over there, and I still have my, like, PI-89 calculator there for doing, like, math on a daily basis. Um, still part of, still part of the job, um, but it's different now. <laughs> so you just started to love the fact that, you know, if you put in enough effort, you can do this. Yeah, yeah. So you were working at app when you were finally experiencing new things and you were learning a lot. Then what made you quit Apple? Yeah, so it's actually a combination of factors. Um, frankly, I think like the main impetus for leaving Apple was a personal tragedy that happened in my life. Um, so my husband was killed by a drunk driver. We were both 27 at the time. Um, and, you know, like I, the most honest answer is that, you know, I kind of, I, working at Apple was great, but it was never like, you know, it was like a means to an end. It was never like supposed to be all there was. Um, and like the, you know, the, the, the goal in life was to have this, you know, have, have a great family. And like, that was really what I wanted. Um, and suddenly that was like no longer possible, or at least not in that immediate time frame. Um, and so it made me really reevaluate how I was spending my time. It made me realize, you know, there's a saying that says like, 
everybody gets two lives. The second one begins when they realize they only get one or something like that, um, which is a Stephen Sotliff, I think, quote. Um, and it, it's very true. Like when you realize that a lightning strike event can happen or, you know, someone can get sick and it could be you, um, you want to make the most of the time that you have. Um, and so I realized that uh, spending my time building objects of art, like Apple Watch and products like this, while exciting, um, was not like enough on its own anymore. Um, and you can't just go like this and build your life back together. Uh, it takes time. Um, and so I decided to try to find something that was more meaningful and solve a bigger problem and have impact because that was something I could control in a situation that felt very out of my control. Um, and so I decided to finish uh, at that moment when that happened, like Apple Watch was just a rumor. Um, we were only about halfway through the program. Uh, so I decided to finish out the program because I believe in finishing things you commit to. Um, but then I made arrangements to leave Apple um, and do something new. Uh, and during that period of time, I was trying to figure out what that was uh, to do, what would be a problem that was meaningful. Um, at first, I thought like maybe that would just mean I would go work somewhere else on something different. Um, and I interviewed a lot of startups. I lived here in the San Francisco Bay Area, so there's a lot of different innovative companies. And I thought like maybe innovation in some way would be exciting to me. Um, but ultimately, in that process, kind of realized that um, that someone else's kind of mission was not my mission um, and that that I wanted to make a bigger impact. And so I took the biggest problem I knew about, which is just the inefficiencies in manufacturing. Um, the scale of those inefficiencies are massive, like 25 cents on every dollar spent. So a huge inefficiency um, that we all kind of in the industry take for granted as the cost of doing business. Um, and mm -hmm. so uh, that problem seemed large, tractable, and incredibly impactful. And I figure if I um, was successful there, that that was big enough to be like, you know, a value of merit uh, for like the purpose in my life. Um, you know, over time, I've been able to rebuild aspects of my life so that that focus has, you know, shifted again. Um, but yeah, I decided to start a company with a coworker of mine from Apple. Um, and we've been working on the, the company's name is Instrumental, and we've been working on this for five years. Um, and the mission of the company is to eliminate this waste, um, a significant portion of this waste in manufacturing, uh, which would be good for everyone. Even if you don't, even if you don't know anything about manufacturing, this will be good for you. This is less energy, less physical waste and scrap, less chemicals going into the environment, and frankly, less people's time that is spent on really not particularly value additive tasks. Um, and instead, people people should be used for all their talents and intuitions, not just because they have fingers and eyes. Um, and so that's the kind of the, the, the vision and well, that's the mission of Instrumental is to, is to make a big impact on the industry. And I think we've already started to see the tide shifting in the industry. And like, from my perspective, it doesn't, like it matters if we're successful or not to my investors, to me personally, but like in the big grand scheme of things at the scale of like life, it, it matters less if we're successful or not, as long as we have impact on the industry and start to push it in the direction it needs to go. Um, and that is a, a worthy cause that like calls me to work every day. I know it's a very hard thing to ask right now for me, and I hope that it's not hard for you to answer, but considering the person you are today, are you, would you have thought the same thing 60 years ago or when the tragedy happened? No, probably not. No, I don't think so. I think like life is uncertain um, and you, you know, you're, they say you like, there's a, an old saying that you can never step in the same river twice. Um, so the river is different every time. Um, and so I don't know, in some parallel universe, like, you know, maybe I have some big family and like, I don't know. Um, that doesn't mean that's not in my own future. It's just not in my in my present. Um, so it's a, it's. I'm sure it would have been a different path. Despite everything that you went through, um, Anna, you're you're a source of inspiration for us right now. Well, thank you. 
<laughs> um, I mean, at least the comments are streaming in, and they're positive, all looking up to you. Some positive out of out of tragedy, some positive out of negative, uh, creation out of destruction. Um, so these are you can't control everything in your life, but you can control what you decide to do next. But when you're like when you're hitting your lows, right? What what was your source of motivation back then on coming back up and springing back up and making it, things work? Uh, well, anyone who's gone through a grieving process will know that grief is like, it's hard. You can't it's you, you, it's you over and run down. back up from grief. It's a process. You have to move through grief. You can't move, you know, you never really move past it. You move through it. Um, and someone once told me, uh, and I thought it was very wise. Um, a, a, a mother of a friend of mine told me that like uh, the burden of your grief doesn't get lighter, you get stronger. Um, and then I think that is a fair assessment of like uh, kind of what hardship does to all of us. And so I'm sure that, you know, even if someone on the, on the call like has, has faced any kind of hardship, like again, it's not that it gets easier, it's that you get stronger. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it's, a. I, I relied on my, my network. I realized the people in my life that, um, you know, really were additive and positive and the people in my life who were not. And I, um, perhaps was a little brutal in, you know, st selecting for people who are positive in that, in that rough time. Um, and you know, like I, I forever learned what it means to be a friend um for the people who were friends to me in that like dark moment and i aspire to be that kind of friend to others um in their dark moments now that i have been taught uh by others what it means to be a good friend i don't i don't think i knew that before um i had to learn it being on the receiving end your experiences have shaped you into a person that you are today so, you know, you, you, it was maybe this was the path that you had to follow in the first place. We think sometimes as a person, we think that, no, that was the path you wanted to do. And this is what we've been like, we, maybe we've ended up and maybe that was, this is where you had to be. Well, this is where I ended up, regardless of whether you believe in like fate or randomness. Um, this is where I've ended up. And, you know, again, like we can only choose our paths forward. We can only choose how we feel about things. Um, and what we do next. And so, um, you know, I chose to uh, spend my late 20s uh, instead of making babies and having a family, I decided to spend it trying to make an impact on, on humanity. Um, whether or not I will be successful in that endeavor has yet to be determined, but that was the, that was what I decided to do next. So is that the time when you st uh, when you thought of founding the Women in STEM program that you founded? Um, that's a good question. I think actually I founded the program before that all happened. Um, so that was an independent experience. Um, so when I was hired at Apple, I was one of two women in a group of about 70 engineers who reported up to one VP. Um, and as like a new grad, I, you know, I, I was kind of naive to uh, the I think there's a lot more awareness now, um, but I was kind of naive that, like, I thought the sexual revolution happened in the 70s, so I thought we were, like, kind of done with that. And certainly as a mechanical engineer at Stanford, it was like, you know, 30% of my classes were women, but that's, like, a pretty good percentage. Like, that wasn't, like, it wasn't so smooth that it was, like, a problem. Um, and so this was kind of my first experience of, like, oh, actually, this is a little weird. And at first... Um, at first, I think like I had like some pride about it, which is very interesting where I was like, oh, I can hang with the boys. Like I'm alpha enough to be able to like, I got New Yorker pointy elbows. I can like, you know, hold my own with all these guys. Um, and, and great people are all great people. Uh, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, I think like over time I realized like, huh, this is a little weird. Like, uh, and I actually started asking questions because um, I was the kind of person I am. I guess I, I guess I kind of start shit like not like you know I didn't really ask questions. Like I'm an engineer, so I'm like, oh, there must be a problem. Like let's look at the data and figure out where the problem is. Like maybe we don't like 
get good candidates or or like maybe don't get any candidates or maybe not that maybe they fail at this part of the interview at this part of the interview or like let's figure out where our pipeline is so we can figure out what the problem was and actually like at that time it was really difficult to get that kind of data because there's all sorts of um protections against discrimination that in at the same time make it hard to actually measure uh what's happening um, so you're not supposed to identify someone's like you know race and ethnicity and gender and measure it because it could also demonstrate that you have bias. And so in a lot of ways, like HR professionals are sometimes in a bind where like in order to measure it, they could be at, at some kind of risk. And so at larger companies, it's, it's a little bit of a challenge. But we were able to get some data that just kind of suggested that. Uh, in general, women didn't do as well in our interview process. Um, and our interview process for this particular group was pretty hard. Um, and so I had this idea that I pitched to my boss to say like, hey, well, like, what if I find um, some students at Stanford and like we get connect them with women here at, at, at Apple um, and we kind of just coach them a little bit on like, here's you know how what you could do to your resume like here's how you would handle a technical interview and like do a little practice not give them the questions but do a little practice of like what those interviews are like um and that that would be like kind of a mentorship program and then those women if they chose to could apply for internships or full-time positions at the end of the academic year and then they would just enter our normal process and the normal interview panel would you know decide if if, if they would be a good fit for the group um, and so they gave me some money to do that, and I um, still had some connections at Stanford through the Society of Women Engineers. Um, and so we started the program, which is now the Women in STEM Mentorship Program at uh, WISMP.org. Um, and we, uh, that first program, I think we started with seven product design and mechanical engineering mentors from Apple, because it was the only people I knew and uh, about 12 or 14 students from Stanford who were studying to be mechanical engineers and were interested um, in like getting coaching on how to prepare for technical interviews. Um, and so that's where it started, was really around supporting the transition from school to industry um, in a very specific field. Uh, but that was back in, in 2013, and since then the program's expanded to include software engineers, um, you know, mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, all sorts of engineers, math, scientists, people interested in going into academia and doing research. Um, so it's, it's really expanded to all kind of fields of STEM, but it started in that first year for a very specific purpose, which was like, can we, can we kind of train people on how to do a hard technical interview? Um, and the kind of success story of that first year was that of the 12 students, I think seven of them got internships or full-time job offers at Apple that summer, um, having like had a little bit of coaching about what to expect. Because it wasn't that the, that the technical aptitude wasn't there, it's that the interview style was so very different than like anything that they'd experience in the academic environment that just kind of having a little practice on like how to deal with a, with a boom, boom, boom technical interview um, really made a big difference for these students. And, and some of them became, you know, like are still at Apple today and like great achievers and performers. Um, and so I think it was like a great investment that Apple made. Um, and then the program grew from there. Um, starting at Apple, but then, um, you know, really ultimately it belonged to the students. So when I left Apple, um, essentially it, it came with me, but like to, to, to stay with the students. Um, and we expanded to multiple universities in the Bay Area and overall to uh, last year to the world, um, being able to support uh, people remotely, women, women in, who are studying STEM fields remotely anywhere in the world. So, um what, what do you think was the major reason that they felt, or their, their expectations weren't right in the first place? Why were the men doing better than the women in the first place? I don't know. Um, you know, like every, every, every workplace and even group within a workplace has a certain culture. Um, and so just because my group had this idiosyncrasy to, does not mean that that's reflective of every group at Apple. It's just, you know, this was like a small problem that I had um, that I saw. And it may just be, you know, it's like part of uh, that interview process has some really hard, like rapid fire interviews that I think if you um, aren't used to that or aren't prepared for it, it could really like startle you. Um, and it just seemed that that amount of startle and fluster 
um, seem to disproportionately affect women who are interviewing, um, even though like their projects were just as strong, their credentials were just as strong, if not better at times. Um, and part of the rationale for such an interview process was because in the role that we were, that like in that role that people were interviewing for that I had, um, there are times when you essentially are in an environment like that at work. So it's not like it's testing something random. It's like you actually need to be able to get up and defend your work and not get flustered um, as part of the job. So it is testing a piece of the job, um, but that's something you can learn to do. Like it's not an intrinsic quality or like an, an, uh, a measure of intelligence or a measure of like your worth. Um, and so I think it's, it was more around like teaching, teaching the method of, of doing, of defending your work, of defending your ideas um, that I think maybe had the most impact. And I, I think also there's a, there's a factor of like, um, you know, seeing others that look like you in, in the crowd that you're, that you're like want to be part of. Um, and so that's like another kind of another purpose of the, of the organization is ultimately around creating the opportunity for women to see people that look like them doing the things that they might want to do. Or in the case of like my personal story where I had no idea like Apple even needed mechanical engineers or all the things I could do with a mechanical engineering degree, um, you know, that's the same across many fields and disciplines. There's all sorts of jobs that are available that you just like don't know when you're a college kid. Um, and so if you have a network that's like, oh, like. I could be a reliability test engineer and like break stuff for a living. That sounds awesome. Like that's not a job they tell you about like in school. Um, you kind of have to find out about it. You have to know one to know that's a job. Um, and maybe that's your passion. And so I think the, the opportunity is to pull, pull people together to make it clear what, that there's some, there's more options out there than you might already know. Um, for 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 the path forward, and certainly there's there's some people who are much more organized than I was, and they know exactly what they want to do, and they, you know they're set on it, and that's great. Um, but for those of us who have less of a plan, um, it can be helpful to get exposure to that variety. So, so you started out with handling the the issue of like the gender biasness, uh, which was like. Uh, intentional but it was there right but now that you think about it how would you try to increase the uh, ethnic diversity uh, and have more women representation from the probably the Western region yeah i mean i think it's a challenging problem i think if it was easy it would be solved like that's my my like my honest answer is that i think if it was easy it would be solved um and so i think but inherently that means it's challenging um, and certainly, like, certainly diversity in all aspects, like, has been shown scientifically to be better. Um, it's good for, like, the economics of business. It's good for, like, not becoming Enron or having, like, big scandals. There's, it's good for creativity on teams. Um, they've done all this research. Like, science says it's better. So why is it, it like, the way things are? I mean, I think that's really frustrating. Um, and I think it can get... I think it can get uh, overwhelming that there is like this big problem that seems very intractable. And so it can be very difficult for women who feel that they like haven't made it yet. Like, oh, I'll solve that problem when I am hot shit, like in the future, when I am Sheryl Sandberg, Marissa Meyer, like, the, you know, like women like that, then I will solve that problem. But I think like, I think that's um, holding oneself to too high of a standard. I think like everybody has more power than they think they have. Um, and so, you know, as an engineer at Apple, I was like three years in, like I had no power. I wasn't like in charge of anything. Like, you know, like I, I'm just like doing my work uh, and I started like starting some shit, right? But like, I had no power, but what I realized is I had more power than the student trying to get the internship. Um, Cause I like knew more than they knew. But that was it. Like that was the that was the piece. And so, like I think the realization that um, that you as an individual can actually make a meaningful difference, even if it's only on a few people, versus solving the whole problem again, break the problem down into small pieces that are tractable. Uh, then you can like reach your hand down to the next to the next group behind you and pull them up. So that's I mean that's kind of what we're doing with with them. Um, and certainly we 
Um, whenever I'm putting on events, I'm always trying to get diverse folks uh, on the panels, whether it's women, men, um, all backgrounds, um, because I think it's really important to see yourself like up there, to see yourself in others. Um, and, uh, and you can find them if you look hard enough. They're there. Um, it's just like maybe you have to look a little harder than like what's obvious or easy. Um, and you ask other people because there are other people um, you can have allies and others to be like, hey, I think this is really important that we represent, um, you know, if we're going to have a panel about like experience of working as like a technical woman, we need to show a variety of women and their experiences and all of those experiences being valid and worthwhile. Um, so anyway, that, that's kind of my take on it. So it's like banning your own perception about how things are and then, you know, just grabbing the opportunities that are coming your way. Um, I mean, I guess you could say that. I think it's more of like uh, believing that one person can make an impact, even if the impact and that the impact is still worth making if it's only on a few people. It's still worth it because um, if everybody if everybody did that, then, you know, exponential growth. Right. So. Um, right. I think it's the I think it's the realization that you don't have to wait until you have arrived to make an impact. I think coronavirus is just talking on the same <laughs> dynamics these days. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> if you spread, if you spread your power to more than one other person, then we have that just that. one more person. Just one yeah. more person. Everybody is like just one more person. Yeah, no, I feel, and I think like, I mean, Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley has this kind of culture that's called pay it forward. And it's actually kind of similar, which is that, um, you know, like uh, the, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Like people are giving here without asking or expecting anything in return. They're paying it forward. Um, maybe someone helped them out in a way that they, you know, didn't expect or didn't feel like was appropriate to ask for. Um, and the ultimate result is like, you know, they had a, you know, a big leap forward and then they like turn around and want to, you know, pay it forward to the next generation, to the next entrepreneur, to the next uh, woman who's trying to get her start. Um, and so I think that mentality is like, is it fits right in as well to this concept of like not having to wait until you've arrived to be part of the solution to the problem. So you were you you analyzed the problem of the inefficiencies in the develop in the manufacturing process, right? Yes. So you wanted to start instrumental with your with your co-founder, right? But you knew the you knew the scale and you knew the impact that it would have. How did you break that down and start and get the confidence to do that? Yeah. Um well, maybe I think one thing my mother did really well is she taught me to be confident. So when people ask where my confidence comes from, I just say my mother because I don't I don't know where it comes from. Um, you know, I, I like I just I believe in myself intrinsically, um, and I, so I think that must be something that my parents did, my my mother did for me. Um, oh, what a great gift! Uh, but yeah, so like in terms of starting a company, where did I get the confidence to start a company? Not everybody is in a financial position to be able to start a company. It's um, it's not financially the best decision to make. Um, True. So you you essentially need to assume it's not going to work, and you're going to make zero dollars, and you have to be okay with that um, as kind of I think as a condition of starting. But I was I was in a position having worked at Apple. Um, for a couple of years that I figured like yeah, I could like not make a salary for a year or two and like see if something happens. Um, and we were very fortunate in that we met an investor very early on who believed in the vision of what we wanted to do, even though we didn't, we kind of had an idea of what that would, physical product would be. Um, but we didn't, we hadn't built it yet. And he believed in us um, very early on and decided to give us a little bit of uh like angel money, uh, angel mm -hmm. investment uh, to get started. Um, and he's still one of our most active investors today. Still a very, I always, I always like uh, say that like 
the best decision I made at Instrumental was like starting it with my co-founder, who's been a great business partner um, and friend in this challenging process. Uh, but the second best decision was deciding to take money from that investor because um, it was a long-term payoff. Um, and very, you know, very excited and great to work with him. I think like the confidence to start a company though came from. I'll, I'll like be honest. Like if you put my if you you try to be empathetic to the position that I was in, like the worst day of my life had already happened. What did I have to be afraid of? Um, that's incredibly powerful, actually. Like I, now, like some years have passed, I'm afraid of things again. But like at that time in my life, like like okay, what's the worst thing that could happen? Like it fails. That's okay. Like that's not that bad. Like I can still go get, you know, pizza or something, like be happy. <laughs> you know, there's like, there are a lot worse things that can happen than the business failing. Um, and so I think like in that way, I took my power back from a situation of something that like happened to me that was out of my control where I was a victim, where my, my husband was a victim and I took my power back. And the power I took back was like, well, I'm just like not afraid. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of because like my worst day has already happened. How freeing is that in life? Um, so yeah, so decided to start this company, um, encouraged by my family. Um, and, uh, you know, this investor that we found very early on who, who put in some money. Um, and that's where we started. So you, you did, you did your mechanical engineering, right? And now that you've developed a product based on artificial intelligence, how did that come around when when did you get the insight that this could be the way that you can uh, solve the problem yeah so it definitely came from the experience having worked in the industry so for those of you who are interested in starting companies i highly recommend spending some time like working at a company any company but working at a company in an industry might be interested in in, in going into um, because you learn so much so essentially i was the user um, I was the, I was as a product design engineer at Apple was the persona of the person who had the pain. Like, and I knew the pain firsthand. Um, we would fly around the world trying to be in the right place at the right time to actually find issues. We had every technological advance at our disposal because it was Apple and not everybody does, but Apple did. And yet we still like relied on luck to find issues. We relied on being in the right place at the right time. I never had the data I needed to do like my best work. It was always something I had to scrabble together from many different places. Um, and so what I would say is the idea for our product is not particularly novel. Like if you go and you talk to people who were what I was, product design engineer, mechanical engineers who work in the electronics manufacturing industry, they'll be like, oh yeah, I thought of that like two years ago. Like it's, it's not that novel of a concept, this idea of like, why don't we just collect all the data so we have it and then use smart algorithms to find the defects so we don't have to rely on luck. Like this is not a novel concept. Um, but I think like the difference is that we went and did it. Um, and I think the difference is like, there aren't that many, it's a software solution to a mechanical engineering problem. And I think that's a unique combination. I think mechanical engineers, if they start companies, they usually start hardware companies to build devices. Um, and software engineers who start companies usually build software to solve software problems. So there's like not a lot of cross overlap with like software for mechanical engineering problems, for hardware problems. And there's actually like a, a dearth of tools um, for mechanical engineers to do their work. And there's all sorts of tools for software engineers. Cause again, you like, you build what you know, right? Like I just said, mm -hmm. like you should learn about it before you build something. So it makes sense that that happens. Um, so we went out to build a software company. Um, at first we thought we might build some robots too. We realized the robots didn't really add to our general value proposition. We thought the robots would be like a Trojan horse for the data, but we realized we could just get the data. And then we didn't have to build the robots, which would be expensive and risky. Um, and so we focused <laughs> on the smallest thing we could do. And the first implementation of instrumental, so we need to collect the data set, that's part of what we do. Um, and we didn't have AI for a long time. So the beginning, the first product was just make the data available, get the right data in front of the right people. And it was literally built on Dropbox. And we literally used point and shoot cameras on like little stands um, and Legos 
like as the first product. And we sold that for thousands of dollars a month uh, to a customer. Um, and they got value out of it. Just having the data was valuable. Um, and then over time, we were able to build up a large enough data set that we could start to build the algorithm so that, you know, in practical terms, like you can't look at all the data because the data is photographic. So like a human can't process, you know, a million images in a second, but a computer can if it has the right algorithms. Um, so we started developing that. We, um, my co-founder and uh, a partner of his, like, developed this proprietary algorithms that are really focused around identifying these anomalies and being able to process very large amounts of photographic data very quickly. Um, and it's a, it's a best in class uh, type of algorithm at this moment in terms of what we provide to the manufacturing industry. And there's nothing like our product on the market. And I think that's because it was a product that was built like by engineers, for engineers, for the engineer that it's for, by the engineer that like was that engineer. Um, whereas a lot of software is is built by software engineers for whoever for whoever must use it, right? Um, as we find out in all sorts of products, especially as women, sometimes like all sorts of products that haven't like really considered um, our role or our jobs or our our lives as separate and different from those of men, um, etc. So it's like you know, adults designing to, uh, toys for children. Like children design the best toys for themselves, right? So. Um, yeah. So you were you were definitely building something for your own self maybe oh, six years ago. <laughs> selfishly, like how would I solve this problem? And with the knowledge that if I solved this problem, it would have the reduction and impact on the inefficiencies, inefficiencies that I could like name and measure. Um, and that's where we started. And so we're in five years at this point. It's been a wild ride. Um, it's been great. Uh, it's been such a growth experience for me personally. I think it's been a growth experience for the industry, frankly, to have us like banging on pots and, you know, like, here's what we got to do. Here's the future, beating the drum. Um, and we're really excited about the next phase of instrumental, particularly how we can use, um, I mean, nobody would wish a crisis like the COVID-19 coronavirus on, on anybody. But given that that is the reality, like how can we, what, it, where is our place in, in not only this crisis and how we helped respond, but where is our place in the future and what does the future look like? And I think the opportunity is that actually, um, since we can't control that, but you know, COVID-19 is here and we're doing the best we can as individuals to control what we can. Um, what we can do is we can use it as a, as a way to build a better world. Um, and I think the opportunity for manufacturing is that uh, this will enable manufacturing as an in industry to innovate um, much faster uh, than it probably would have otherwise um, because it's going to be forced to. Uh, and there, you know, there's nothing like, you know, necessity, the mother of invention, like there's nothing, um, you know, there's nothing as good as being forced to do something to get it done. Um, and so I think that's really exciting and that's good for everybody. Again, like, Manufacturing is half of the world's GDP. So a 25% efficiency improvement in something that's half of the world's GDP is like a big deal. And even if you're not in the industry, you will feel it in some way through cheaper prices, better products, cleaner air, you know, less energy um, usage. So there's a lot of like win-win benefits for everyone for that particular thing. Um, and so instrumental is, is uh, trying to lead in this area um, along with other business leaders uh, in the manufacturing space to, uh, to drive this innovation forward during this very special time in the industry. So the, the future of AI and uh, sorry, the future of the manufacturing industry that you're talking about and the economic uh, gap that we have, what would you suggest to the people who are just especially the women who are pursuing a uh, degree these days in mechanical engineering. And what would like, I suggest? Learn differently. Yeah, what should they learn differently? What should they do differently? Or what should they, even if they, I know there's not much they can do in the academic period, or what at least what their focus should be to achieve eventually. I mean, manufacturing as an industry is here to stay, and it's a good industry to be in. Um, it's, uh, there are, Becoming a manufacturing expert, though, is is kind of, um, and I would I would not necessarily call my to make a distinction here. 
I work in manufacturing and I understand how to build millions of products, but there's all these specialties in manufacturing for, uh, you know, paint coatings, um, different types of tooling for metal parts, for plastic parts, et cetera. There's all sorts of specialties that are, um, that exist. And there's frankly like a, not a lot of, um, the young people going into these, these specialties, but we still need them. And, and without them, it's inefficient to build the products. Um, and so there's a lot, I would just say, there's a lot of opportunity in manufacturing for young people. Um, it's maybe not the sexiest on the outside, but I promise you on the inside, it's really cool. Uh, it's really, really cool. This concept that like, you could like make a change on a line and 15 minutes later, like they're building that change thing at scale every eight seconds, another one popping out. It's just like, it's magic. Um, it's so fascinating. And it's not for everybody, but like if, if it's something that you're interested in, it's definitely like, I think a strong career choice, a safe career choice. And I would say, um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, like, the life will always throw you curveballs you don't expect, but if you if you kind of find your passions and stay aligned with your passions, um, then maybe life won't be too bad. <laughs> so, you you have a lot of perception and you gain that from your life experiences. How does that shape you as a founder? And what do you like? How do you build the culture of Instrumento? And uh, yeah, uh, it's a great question. Um, it is one of the jobs of being founder CEO of a company is to build a culture. And I would say that uh, I think in the early days, to me, it seemed a little superfluous. I'm just going to be honest here. It's going to be controversial. It seemed a little superfluous to focus on something like culture when we were just trying to survive. Um, they're like, there's a risk that we would die as a company. And that seemed like a bigger problem than what the culture was. Um, but the team was also small. So like, I think the culture itself was more emergent. Um, and there wasn't like a, you know, like force a culture, frankly, generally the culture of companies kind of reflects the, the best and worst of their founders. Like it's kind of, um, and, and as you, as you age as a company, as you grow as a company, as there's like more time to spend like thinking about what you want, you can actually design cultures in a way that can be really beneficial to, you know, emphasize the positives and try to de-emphasize the negatives. But of course there's always, there's always a duality. There's always both positives and negatives. One of the things that we're really focused on at Instrumental in terms of our culture um, is, is trying to be very simple uh, and clear um, and so it is actually quite simple. You talk to you talk to a company about their cultural values, and they have like seven or ten different values. And instrumental, we have one value and two constraints, and that's it. Um, and that kind of sums up who we are as an organization. And I think it sums up who the founders are as well. Um, and so I think it is it feels aligned, uh, you know, top to bottom. And the people who come to work at Instrumental, um, you know, value those same kind of cultural values. Um, and so the, the main value is that we play to win. Um, that's what we're here to do. Like we're not just here working to have a job. We're here to make an impact and like move towards the mission and we're playing to win. Like if we aren't, if we aren't playing to win, then what are we doing? Um, however, <laughs> there are ways you could play to win that would be, um, that would maybe not be uh, great would not be positive right like you could like kick your teammate and that would like not be considered you know the right thing to do so like we we have constraints on playing to win and one is um we very much believe in being helpful being helpful to our customers to each other we're helpful people um and the other is working with joy um which has to do with uh essentially being transparent about how and aware of like kind of how we feel about situations at work and if we find like a meeting is particularly tense, um, then there's actually probably something else happening. And so it's actually a self-awareness towards continuous improvement is what work with joy means. And so the combination of work with joy and be helpful with play to win as the overall arching goal kind of gives you a sense of like who we are as instrumentalists and, and our mission. Uh, like we want to win, but we're going to, we're going to play as a team um, and we win or lose as a team. Um, and so uh, 
uh, it's pretty, it's a pretty great place to work, I have to say. Um, but this is a, this is not something that can be totally architected out of the blue. You can't just like write down five qualities that um, are not really part of who you are if you're a founder. And, and be like, oh yeah, we're gonna be, like I'm, like let's say, like I'm super like organized in type A, and if I wanted like the company culture to not be that, I think that'd be really hard. Like it was just, it, it just doesn't like make sense. It needs to kind of make sense all the way top to bottom. Um, design <laughs> culture is a very interesting topic, but it's really also something that I think happens over time and in the, in the early stages, I think is probably not worth as much of the hype as people talk about because really you're just trying to stay alive as a company. And that's really understandable. It, your company should reflect you and it should reflect back. And then I think that that's where the sync, uh, like the sync comes in. And then well, then I mean, like, you don't really have a choice. Hardly. It's going to reflect you regardless of if you want it to or not. So at least try to pick the positive things that it could reflect about you and your, you know, and your co-founder. Like my co-founder is one of the most, um, like helpful people I know in terms of just his personality. And so this is kind of a big piece of, of the constraint on the play to win. I mean, like I aspire to be as helpful as he is, but he just like embodies that as a person. Um, and so there's the other thing is that a culture is a hybrid of like many people and an individual may be one place or another place and everybody kind of adds to that overall what the culture is um and so it's not trying to find people that are like directly like right in line it's trying to, to create a group of people that can work together well with shared values um, so you as a founder when you were conducting the interviews for hiring people what are the three top qualities you look for yeah, that's a great question. Um, we've gotten better at that over time. <laughs> um, so I would say hiring people for all the like entrepreneurs and, and, and folks out there who are interested in being entrepreneurs, learning how to hire people is hard. Um, I don't know that I'm good at it. <laughs> I'll just admit. Um, it's hard. Um, it's really difficult. And so uh, one of the, you know, we've over time, we've like evolved our process. And one of the most important things we look for are those values playing to win, you know, help like a, like a propensity towards being helpful, um, you know, a propensity towards like passion and joy um, is, is something that we do look for in an interview process. Another major thing we look for is what we call grit. Um, and there's all sorts of kind of things online about interviewing for grit, but we, we really value that because we are a startup. Not every day is going to be a good day. Um, not every day is going to be easy. Some days are going to be hard. That doesn't mean they won't be worth it, but they will be hard. Um, and there will be times that things are uncertain. And so we, we look for people who have demonstrated just their own life experiences, not even necessarily that they, you know, have like a big resume full of all sorts of like experience in the in the in the role but also that they have life experience where they had to be resilient and gritty and kind of overcome you know uh the unknown or you know a bad situation um and can be reflective and self-reflective uh of kind of you know here's what i learned from that situation that i can take forward so like continuous learning is kind of another thing we look for um and I, I wouldn't say that any of this is particularly novel. I, I, this is just what we have found to uh, correlate best with success and instrumental. So like on an ending note, since we're like very short time left, what's one advice that, you know, if you could give to our community, what would that be? Because we are like struggling women, we're starting our own professions and careers, or some of us want to start our own startups, anything. I would say, don't call yourself a struggling woman. Like you just characterized it negatively already. I think like I think ultimately, I mean it sounds corny, but I think it's I I really think it's like believe in the power of one person to change something, even if it's small, and that one person could be you. And maybe it could be big. Um, so I think it's it's that belief and and start talking to yourself like you're not a struggling woman, you're a aspiring uh and you're emerging um and so so that would be my advice thank you so much 
thank you so much for your time. Uh, it was really nice talking to you, and the audience have been enjoying your uh, analogies and your quotes. They've been like taking taking notes, and um, this it was really an interesting session with you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We had Anna Katrina from US with us and I hope you had an interesting session. See you soon guys. Bye bye.